So I just got done watching episode two of Euphoria starring Zendaya, and there is a lot to unpack from this episode. What is up everybody? This is Chris from The Rewired Soul, where we talk about the problem, but focus on the solution. And if you're new to my channel, what I like to do is take different topics from the YouTube community or movies or TV shows, try to see what lessons we can pull from them to improve our own mental and emotional well-being. So if you're into that stuff, make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell. And if you're on social media, so am I. So follow me, baby, at The Rewired Soul on Instagram and Twitter. I love engaging with all of you. I give away free books and all sorts of cool stuff. So follow me over on social media. So yeah, in this video, I'm going to focus around Zendaya's character, Rue, in episode two. I mentioned this in my last video that I, I do enjoy doing character breakdowns of shows like this because each one kind of has their own thing. So if you can relate to a specific character, in this show and would like me to do more character breakdowns of any specific episodes like let me know down in the comments below like for example um the uh what's her name cassie like she has a very interesting storyline that i think some people might be able to relate to um and there's some other things going on so anyways just let me know down in the comments below i'm here to service you baby all right anyways so yeah let's talk i want to go over uh, a few things um, those of you who don't know me, um, I'm a recovering drug addict and alcoholic. That's one of the reasons why, you know, it's awesome to make character breakdowns of Rue in this show. Um, I just celebrated seven years of sobriety yesterday. And much like Rue, my addiction was primarily with prescription opioids, all right? So anyways, the first thing that I, I don't think a lot of people understand about addiction, but they did a really good job depicting it in the scene where they were asking the students, like, what'd you do on your summer vacation? And, you know, they went to Rue, and one of the things is that, obviously, everybody knows, right? Like, Rue, when she comes back to school, she's nervous and knows everybody knows that she overdosed, right? But anyway, she starts to feel this sense of panic. Now, think about it. Like, this is the insanity that we can get into when we're addicted to drugs. So the stress, the source of her stress was the fact that she used drugs, right? And now everybody knows that she used drugs to the point where it almost killed her and she overdosed. So when that stress came back, what was her solution? To go use the drugs. Like, isn't that crazy, right? Like, this is something that I can relate to if you're somebody in recovery from addiction, you might be able to relate to it as well. It's insane how our brain turns to that for the solution, even though it's the problem. Like when people would call me out on my drinking or my drug use, I would get angry at them or upset or embarrassed of what they found out about me. And then my solution was to go find and use some drugs or have a drink, like what? So a few things from the scene where she's at the 12 step meeting, just a couple things. I might do a whole video, my beautiful girlfriend Tristan, like she always hears me ranting about it. She's like, you need to get like a montage together. But anyways, whenever they show a 12 step meeting, like it's always one person in the front talking to an audience. And it is so rare that that's actually what a 12 step meeting looks like. In most meetings, like that's not what it is. And the reason why it bugs me is because if people are looking at that, like I had a ton of social anxiety. And if I thought that 12 step meetings were all about like you stand in front and just speak in front of everybody, like I'd be scared to go there. Like most meetings, like probably 95 to 99% of meetings, unless you are the speaker at a meeting, you are not going to stand up in front of everybody else. Most of the time you don't even have to share if you don't want to. But anyways, um, she hasn't been going to meetings and she had to get um, a meeting slip signed. And it was very common, so for a few reasons. Some people are court ordered to go to 12 step programs, so they have to have them signed as proof to the judge. For me personally, I was in a sober living house and we were required to go to five meetings a week. So we had to get the same thing signed. And one thing that was crazy was I thought I was better than the other people who were court ordered because I was there just in a sober living house who needed to get this slip signed. But anyways, I'm no better than anybody. I'm no less than. It's just something that I had to learn in my recovery. And if you're in recovery, just understand that. You're no better than anybody who's in there through a drug court program. But it's, it's common for people to not go. Um, a lot of people like Rue in this scenario, she doesn't want to get sober. She doesn't want to do these things. So she went up to the guy and she was like, yo, can you just fill these out for me? So here's the thing. Here's what was unrealistic about this. And don't get any ideas if you're in the same situation as her. Like in most cases, you wouldn't go to the person running the meeting and ask them to fill out a bunch of like signatures. Like think about it. Like think, like it surprises me too because the writer and director of the show 
like a lot of this is pulled from his own experience as like from his addiction like in most cases you would just have somebody forge the signatures for you like i used to forge my own signatures but rue had her friend who gave her the the, the clean urine why would she just have her friend sign it as well? It's not like whoever she turns that into knows what these signatures look like because there's different people who sign those slips at every single meeting. But by the way, like I said, don't get any ideas, go to your dang meeting. So this scene right here, like it, it was kind of interesting because in episode one, you know, they talked about how Rue started, you know, taking her, her medications to calm down her anxiety and that's when she started to self-medicate with drugs. But then it shows her, her scene with her dad and her dad who is, you know, dying of cancer and he's on a lot of medications, like she would get high next to him. So I'm wondering which one was the exact source. Was it self-medicating or did she just start stealing her dad's meds or was it a combination of both? But you guys, this is actually very, very, very common for drug addicts. They will steal medications from a loved one who is sick, right? Um, and a lot of people feel really guilty about this. Like I, I worked in an addiction treatment center for three years and I hear this story a lot. Like they had a loved one who was dying and they were stealing their medications to get high. And it's awful like because you, you feel guilty about it, but that guilt makes you want to self-medicate even more with the substances, right? Like in my active addiction, I didn't have anybody who was passing away, but here's the thing, like I was such a fiend for prescription drugs. Like whenever I went to anybody's house, whether it was my grandma's house or like a friend's house, hell, I even went through like my roommate's medicine cabinet. Like I was looking for something that I could use to get high. Like, so if you have any drug addicts in your life, like lock your medications up. Okay, because we will look and we will go find them anywhere. And by the way, while I'm on this, while I'm on the subject about people taking medications from people who are being prescribed from them, like I know a lot of people have issues who are being prescribed medications for chronic pain. Like some some states require it or some doctors require it to drug test a person who is getting prescribed the medications. And the reason this is, is to make sure that they're actually taking the medications. And why is that? Because there are people like me <laughs> or like Rue where we steal the medications or a lot of people who are being prescribed these medications don't even take them, they just sell them instead. So this right here, like if you're not an addict to like, if you've never had an addiction, it probably doesn't make any sense. It probably doesn't make any sense why Rue wanted to be there, you know, when she came over looking for drugs and her, her buddy, like, he, he was like, yo, these guys are coming over. You need to get out right now. And she's like, no, I'm just going to sit here. I need the drugs, right? Like, this, like, this was so relatable. Like, when we are craving, when we need drugs, like, we will do just about anything. I would, I would wait for hours for a drug dealer. I would be in the most dangerous situations waiting for a drug dealer, right? But I'll say this. Like, I was telling my girlfriend that her drug dealer in the show kind of reminds me of one of the dealers I had. But going back to the last point I made about how people who are being prescribed these medications for like chronic pain will sell them. Like this scene right here, and by the way, again, don't get any ideas, but most of my drug dealers were old women. So 99% of the time I didn't have to deal with what Rue was dealing with in that situation with some like big gangster dude like messing with her. Like most of my drug dealers were like old women getting way too many medications and they were just selling to me, all right? So the last thing is, is the drug dealer has her try fentanyl. If you guys don't know what fentanyl is, like hopefully you do because there's a massive epidemic right now. Fentanyl is being mixed with all sorts of drugs. Cocaine, Xanax, other prescription opioids, heroin, and it's one of the main causes of overdose. Fentanyl is like, God, I can't remember the exact number. It's either 50 or 100 times more potent than heroin. But that's why he, like the dealer only needed to get a little bit on his knife for her to take it, right? And she's scared. And there was a few things running through my mind as I was watching it. Like the first one was, is like, I hope, I hope she doesn't get hooked on this, right? Because that's what happened. Like I am so fortunate that during my prescription opioid addiction, I never tried heroin. Because that scenario right there is very common, right? Where somebody at, uh, offers you something stronger. Like I, I had many occasions when a dealer would be out of pills and they would be like, but I got heroin. And like, luckily I never progressed to that. But the thing is like many people, they progress to heroin and it's cheaper. It's a stronger high. It's more potent. It's more dangerous, right? So when Rue tried the fentanyl, I'm like, oh God, I hope she doesn't get 
addicted to this because like you saw in the first episode where she talks about like she's constantly just chasing that right but the second thing i thought was you know what her dealer <laughs> i was told my girlfriend i'm like her dealer bet he has some narcan and she's like what what if he doesn't have narcan but then a few seconds later she like he the dealer told his little brother or whoever that kid is like hey, yo go get the narcan just in case booga so those of you who don't know what narcan is if you have anybody in your life who is struggling with a opioid addiction, like please check this, your state laws, check your pharmacies, check your doctors, and ask them about the availability of Narcan because in many states, I know we started doing it here in Nevada, you could buy Narcan over the counter. And what Narcan is, it is an opioid overdose reversal drug, okay? So when opioid overdose happens, like opioids are a depressant, causes shallow breathing, all sorts of things, you can vomit, choke on your vomit, all sorts of stuff. But what happens is, is basically, by the way, I went through a Narcan training, so trust me on that. So anyways, what happens is, is the opioids are blocking the opioid receptors, right? Or they're, they're inhabiting the opioid receptors. What Narcan does like almost instantly is it comes in and it pops those things right out. So you go, <gasps> right? You will be saved from an overdose. But depending on how much you did, how potent it was, like I've heard of some people needing like, four or five hits of Narcan in order to be revived. Narcan comes in a few different forms. Um, typically it's like a nasal spray. Some of them are like a shot or whatever it is, but always have Narcan available. Like um, if you look in your city for like Narcan trainings, like I know there's places here in Las Vegas, like if you go through a Narcan training, sometimes it will give you like a free Narcan kit. But also, like I said, check with your pharmacies. Like I, I almost guarantee, and you can let me know, let me know down in the comments below if your state or your area does this. But I can almost guarantee in areas where heroin is a major problem, like in the Pacific Northwest or like in West Virginia and places like that where a ton of people are using heroin, I guarantee there is easier access to Narcan. So it's important that you know what that stuff is because you might be able to save a life, all right? But anyways, anyways, again, let me know down in the comments below if there's any other characters that you want me to break down from episode two and talk about, you know, something that they're dealing with, if you could relate to it, let me know so I can make some more videos on it, all right? But anyways, that's all I got for this video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you're new, make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell because I make a ton of videos. And a huge, huge thank you to everybody supporting the channel over on Patreon. You're all amazing. And if you'd like to become a patron, support what I'm doing here, get access to some other perks and benefits, Click or tap right there, all right? Thanks again so, so much for watching. I'll see you next time.